Hello, and welcome to our second episode of the Director's Cut of the HIPAA Survival Guide. Today, uh, I'm joined by Mr. Carlos Leva, uh, CEO of Three Lions Publishing, publisher of the HIPAA Survival Guide, and he's also the managing shareholder of the Digital Business Law Group. I'm John Nelson. I'm an associate at the Digital Business Law Group and the Technology Evangelist at Three Lions Publishing. We also have uh, Mr. Martin Gwen here, Director of Operations. So. Director's Cut is uh, a spin-off of the Ask Me Anything Friday series that we used to do here at HSG. And uh, we like to have this uh, in a conversational format. Obviously, we cannot uh, cover everything through each topic uh, that we'll address on the series. So if you have any questions, uh, anything piques your interest, or you'd like more discussion on a particular topic, feel free to get in touch with us. Um, either through uh, email, uh, admin at um, I'm sorry, support at threelinespublishing.com or any of the various social media and online um, presences we have. So today we will be discussing breach notification, what we like to call the 800-pound gorilla of HIPAA high-tech compliance. So Carlos, when, uh, breach notification is a part of the privacy uh, um, <clears throat> Excuse me. Breach notification is really a uh, a game changer in in regulatory compliance for HIPAA and high tech. So, why is it a game changer, and why did this whole 800 pound gorilla uh, terminology get coined? Right. So, um, so 800 pound gorilla is just something that 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 I coined, and really nobody nobody's pushed back on because um, prior to the High Tech Act, which was promulgated in 2009. Uh, there was no breach notification. Okay, you could experience a breach, but you weren't required to notify HHS of that fact. You weren't required to notify patients of that fact. You weren't required to notify, in certain instances, major media of that fact. So the High Tech Act changed all that. The High Tech Act, among many other things, okay, including having uh, business associates be statutorily on the hook, which was another sort of game changer. It, it, the High Tech Act forced covered entities to report breaches, and if it was uh, even of a breach of a single record has to be reported. Uh, a breach of 500 or more records, I think it may be 501, uh, but I'm not sure. I get confused between 500 or 501 for various reasons that are nuanced uh, and, and specific to the breach notification rule. But the the if you have 500 or more, you wind up on the HHS. Hall of Shame, uh, which I, I wish I had uh, coined that term, but I didn't, and you uh, and you wind up, the, you, you're out there forever on, on the internet, on their Hall of Shame. They don't call it that, but I don't know what they call it, but the, this is, uh, and they explain the breach and how many records were breached, and, and then they're, they're um, mandated uh, to do an investigation. They're going to audit you. So if you have a breach and you announce it, uh, which uh, you're required to do if if breach notification is in fact triggered, you're going to get some press and you're going to get some uh, fines, um, civil monetary penalties. We'll just that's a lot to say. We're just going to call them fines, and basically it's going to it's going to ruin your day. Okay, so this put the teeth when we talk about prior to 2009, prior to the High Tech Act, that that uh, HIPAA was a a paper tiger, toothless tiger. This put the teeth into HIPAA, okay? And this has remained the driving force of, of uh, attempting to get the healthcare industry to wake up from its slumber of noncompliance to begin paying attention to privacy and security as uh, things that they deliver and uh, on a day-to-day -day basis as part of their value proposition to their uh, patients, okay? It's been a slow process. But this was a total game changer. So it sounds like um, <clears throat> it sounds like it's uh, something of a Democlean sword uh, over everyone's head that certainly wasn't there uh, with HIPAA enforcement uh, by HHS in the past. Uh, and you mentioned that your uh, that HHS is required to launch an investigation if uh, if your breach is uh, over 500. And so if they're required to do an investigation, then if you have a breach of less than 500, then does that um, 
does that also get reported just to HHS? Uh, does it get reported at all? And to what extent does that increase uh, your likelihood of, of being investigated or, or being looking down the barrel of fines? Yeah, so I want to sort of backtrack a little bit here um, to, to not confuse uh, what, ha what happens in practice with the actual letter of the law. Um, it's not clear to me, uh, I could go back and read the rule, it's not clear to me that um, that I've ever seen that it's mandated, absolutely mandated in the law that HHS, if you have a breach over 500, um, is, is going to, by law, going to uh, investigate. It's more that you can rest assured that they're going to investigate if you have one of these breaches. Okay, right. as, as one of their own internal best practices. They, it's all over the press. I mean, they're now going to have to look at what are your other policies and procedures that may have prevented this particular breach. Okay, so the mandate is sort of a kind of like a best practice, right? You would just expect them to, and they do, in fact. Now, I, I don't believe that if you have a breach of like 499, that they may not investigate. They may also choose to investigate that. But generally, you know, the 500, the 500 is such a small breach. I mean, we've seen breaches of thousands of records, right? It's a really, really small breach to wind up on, on the Hall of Shame. So, but if it was 499, would they not investigate? They might, you know, if they had other. But again, I don't think it's like mandated. For example, um, the High Tech Act mandated audits, okay? And HHS was to develop regulations on how those audits were to take place. And HHS is in the process of actually doing desk audits and refining their audit protocol. It's taken a while, but they're in the process of doing it. That was mandated by um, by the High Tech Act. Okay, I don't believe this was man this, this audit on on if you have a breach is mandated. But again, it's it's sort of a uh, a best practice. And now, who do you who do you notify? So here's the thing: HHS always gets notified. If it's over 500. Or 500 and over, all right. Um, the um, you you have to notify right away within 60 days, okay. And you're going to wind up on the on, on the wall of shame, okay. Have to within mm -hmm. 60 days. If it's under that number, let's say it was just one, two, ten, or 499, you have to notify HHS within 60 days of the end of the calendar year, okay. And it is calendar year. It's not fiscal year. It's at the end of the calendar year. So. Number one, HHS always gets notified. Number two, whether you have 10,000 or one patient that uh, whose PHI was compromised, the patient always gets notified. Okay? Okay. Now, whether you notify local media, again, depends on the number of patients' PHI that was compromised. Okay, and this is the reason why I get confused between 500 and 501, because one is 500 and the other one is 501. But the, the if you have, if you, I, I think the state, if you have 500 or more, so I, I believe it's got to be greater than 500 uh, to notify HHS. But if you have 500 or more in one state or jurisdiction in a breach, 500 or more patients whose pay, whose PHI was compromised and who happen to be residents of that state. Then you have to notify uh, major local media as well as the patients, okay? Because maybe the patients' uh, contact um, information is outdated. Maybe some patients don't have email, whatever reason, okay? And let's say that those patients were scattered across uh, the state, like Florida. Let's say they were the north, northern part of Florida, the middle part of Florida, the southern part of Florida. You would have to notify major media in each one of those areas because you have to try to cover and reach patients. Okay. Now, the difference is, let's say you had 250 patients in Georgia that were impacted by this particular breach and 251 in Florida. In that case, HHS still needs to get notified. Um, the wall of shame is still triggered, okay, because it's it's in the aggregate. But because you don't have 500 or more in a single state or jurisdiction, you don't have to identify major media, okay. Needless to say, 
uh, and it's still it's all within 60 days. Right? So needless to say that that if you have a, a a a significant breach or really any breach, you ought to be working with counsel to figure out what what you're going to do, uh, and if in fact you know breach notification was triggered. And I mean, the, the, and there's whether or not it's triggered is a separate question that that, that we've been talking about that we've been talking about here. It's been um, um, did you guys hear that? Well, uh, yes. Um, yeah, that that was actually. Uh, I, I think the next topic to talk about. No, no, so no, 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 no. I'm sorry. Did you hear the? Did you hear the battery low on my? Uh, uh, no. On my headset. Okay. So I don't know why this thing didn't charge. Uh, I should have known that it hadn't charged because it said only five hours. So what I'm going to do is unplug it and use, and we're, we're going to have to restart and, and use the uh, microphone from the PC, okay? Because mm -hmm. it's going to run out in the middle of this thing. Sorry about that, but it said five hours. I didn't think. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes. You can still hear me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's interesting that um, it says it says that I'm using Plantronics, but I'm not using Plantronics. I'm using the the real. I'm gonna change it. Well, oh, can't you just can't you just plug? Are you too far away from a, a USB to just plug it in and use it and be a little attached to the computer? No, the headset is. The headset is um, so the headset is detachable, right? And hold on a second. Yes. Yeah, Can you yeah hear me? it does sound it does sound more echoey, but yeah. Oh, you're still you're still hearing me. That's weird. You're still hearing me through the through Plantronics. What about now? Yep. Sam. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm gonna turn the Plantronics off. You can hear me okay. Uh, sound quality is a little off, but yeah, I can hear you. Martin, I mean, how, how far off is it? Um, let's see. Yeah, there's no way to plug this bitch in. Yeah, there's no way to plug this bitch in directly because it's it's a it's the only about you know it's disconnected headset. It's meant to be used disconnected. So there's no plug directly into Oh, the, uh, it is battery powered and you're out of batteries? Is that what you're saying? It, yeah, the, the thing was battery low, even though it said it was going to be charging for five hours. Mm. So, I mean, what's the perceptible drop in the quality of the audio? It just sounds like you're um, further away in an echoey room. At the bottom of a well. Does Debbie have a microphone or a headset? Yes, she does. Um, well, if you offer to offer her two nights in the chair for the use of her headset, would she? No. I'm just wondering. Uh, let me go. Let me talk to her about it. Yeah, I'm just wondering. There's probably just a simple operation of to, to pair to this PC. It's not like you just borrow it. Let me go get it. Okay. Uh, before we restart, it's nice to have like a um, five-second interlude so that 
I don't have to get the exact second and when I re-record this. What do you mean get the exact second? In other words, with the other one, he he was still talking when we cut it off and um, he started again immediately as soon as we went to the five, four, three, two, one. So I, I will force, so it, it stopped at uh, 211 and it started at 212. So it's just a pain in the ass to do it. A nicer, a, a, a nicer um, blank space or dull air space is easier to work with because I can start it anywhere in the five second period and no one's going to know the difference. I will attempt to start it on the top, but. Okay. These are heavy negotiations. <laughs> yeah. Okay, I get three days in the chair. <laughs> Might go up higher than that. It shouldn't be bad because when I plug it mine in, I have to wait for the session to start, and then I mine I put my little Logitech uh, doohickey in the. Um, USB port and it says you want to use new hardware, but if I have it in before I start it doesn't recognize it It's kind of bizarre that way Yeah um, Mine mine's kind of the opposite way it will always recognize it if I have it in to start um, But if I put it in afterwards, then sometimes it asks me if I want to use the new hardware Sometimes it just doesn't so I have to go in and fix that manually It's not yeah. a big deal. No no. Did you see Jon Snow yet? Come on. <laughs> no. No. You got to look at that. I mean, um, I've seen a couple. I will. Episodes. I am looking forward to it. I'm not bullshitting you. Yeah. Uh, I've seen a couple episodes, and he's so serious in that. And in this setting, it's just, um, I mean, it's a hoot. Who's the fuck is Jon Snow? Um, one of the the second late night show after uh, on NBC after um, whoever that is anymore. You know who Jon Snow is? I, I, I do not. Jon Snow is so, uh, one of the major characters in uh, Game of Thrones, and he's always wearing this bearskin rug and so on and so forth. So they've taken him out of the medieval setting and put him in a dinner party. And the dinner party is the host of the, the the late night show, and they've got I think two a couple and two single ladies there, and you know, <clears throat> and he's had a lot of tragedies in his existence in this five years. Is it five years, John? Uh, yeah, well, five or six. Yeah, five, you know, um, and they're trying to make nice dinner talk. <laughs> And he just said, if you don't know it, um, you might not understand it. I mean, he'll come up with something like, winter is coming. And um, whatever the beasts are that, that come with winter and so on and so forth. And they take him, a, host takes him aside and says, John, you got to lighten up a little bit. And he said, okay, you know, talk, talk about, you know, talk about other stuff, you know, talk about your family. So they ask him about his brother, and he says, my brother was killed at his wedding, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Do you have any siblings is the uh, question. So uh, it, it's, it's just. What is about Game of Thrones that is such, you know, such a huge city? What's that? It's a freaking med medieval I'm soap sorry. opera. I'm, I'm sorry. It's a, medieval, it's a medieval soap opera with dragons. What more could you want? No, but I mean, what, what, what is it wildly popular? You got some hard bitches, the hot bitches on there. It's a storyline. What, what is it? It's uh, derived from a book series um, by George R.R. R. Martin. That's uh, uh, very, that, that's had a following for 
you know, 20 years or something like that. The guy is notorious for being slow with getting out his books. You know your, um, you know your your phrase, real artist shit. Well, he's never heard of that. Um, <laughs> so people are people are concerned that this guy's gonna die before he finishes the series because um, because he's he's only like in his mid 60s right now. But based on like based on the delay time between releasing books, he's got like one or two more to go, and the last one it took him like 10 years to to finish. Wow. So anyway, it's, wow. just, it's this wildly popular uh, book series that HBO I has picked up. I Big gotcha. production values and treachery and shit like that. I got you. I got you. Cool. Um, so I'm back on headset. Can you, hopefully this is better. You're fine. It's better. Yeah. Okay. So Martin, you're going to have to restart this. Um, how do you do that? Uh, we're not going to restart it. We're just going to take a five-second pause and start over, and then I, that makes it a lot easier to get the cut space. Where do you cut it? I, I cut it where at the beginning of the five seconds or somewhere in the no, five I, seconds. I, I, and I, I, start how do you and cut it and record it from there? Like what, what program do you use to cut it? What, do they have some tools that let you cut it? Yeah, snag it. Really? Really. Camtasia. So you bring it in to snag it now? Or like bring it in? I, know I, I just bring it, it up and run it and pick a spot. Um, okay. All right, cool. All right, so we want to be on this page. But where were we? The, the, the problem is you got to start. You, huh? you, need, you need to start over. Well, that's what I was saying. If we need to start over. Yes. Uh, we need to start completely over. No, we, we really can start on the second question, I think, right? John, we completed the I, just, just start over and just give some air space in between so it's easy to find when I go to catch it. Well, you do a countdown then, and then we'll pause for um, a few know, count seconds. To 30, count to 30. No, no, I don't need 30 seconds. I just need like five seconds so that you're not we'll ending in the beginning. Not the 15, and then, so you were going to start with John's intro at Hipper's Director's Cut. Correct. All right, are you going to push record again? Is that what you're going to do right now? No, I haven't stopped recording. Okay, so, I mean, we, we should be able to do it on the on the second question. I mean, I know that uh, Snagit uh, can, can let you cut that shit, but um, Camtasia gives uh, a lot more options there. Oh, you got more and, tools on Camtasia if you want to do it on that. Yeah, we yeah, can just start, let's the start with the second. We'll start with the second question. All right, and then once we're we're done, um, you you can just send me the raw uh, footage and and we'll you can cut it. you can cut and paste it. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so everyone ready? Yep. <clears throat> All right, so we've talked about uh, when you have a breach of 500 or more records or 501 records or more and the, uh, uh, the necessity for HHS to actually conduct an investigation at that point. Once your name is on the wall of shame and, and uh, you're dealing with plenty of other things, uh, that will be a uh, mandated process. So what about when you have a breach of five records or 499 records, you know, to what extent does that really increase your odds of a investigation or fines coming down the road? What's the process there? Yeah, so let me clarify something between a best practice and whether something is absolutely legally mandated as far as an audit goes. I, I don't recall ever seeing a legal mandate that says if there's a breach over 500 uh, that HHS will automatically conduct an audit. I think it's a best practice. These breaches are obviously going to make the wall shame. 500 or more, you're going to be on the wall shame. You have to notify HHS within 60 days. Uh, you may or may not have to notify the press, depending on certain things we're going to uh, talk about here in a moment. But uh, HHS will conduct a, 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 an audit because it wants to know, you know, did you have policies and processes in place that could have prevented this? Okay, and that's one of the reasons that it, that breach notification is, is an 800-pound gorilla. It's almost guaranteed to produce an audit on the part of HHS. Now, 
you know, will there be an automatic audit as a best practice if the record count is 499 or 450? That's going to be up to HHS. And I think on some of these, probably, right, because, they, because where there's smoke, there's fire. And they have an obvious place to go after. And so, uh, and so they probably would, right? So I, I think the calculus is going to be definitely, if you're on the wall, saying they're just going to do it as a best practice. Because imagine there's this huge breach and, you know, there's a follow-up question at a press conference. Well, you know, Ms. Secretary or Mr. Secretary, did you do a follow-up audit? Well, no. <laughs> that's not, I mean, that's really not going to apply as a best practice enforcement, a best enforcement practice on, on the part of HHS, correct? So uh, I don't believe the High Tech Act actually mandates the, uh, that audit. Okay, so um, we've uh, discussed now what what happens when there's uh, a larger breach, and actually 500 is, is pretty small, right, and, and an even smaller breach than that. So let's back up a second and talk about how you know if breach has been triggered, if notification uh, has been triggered, because that seems to be a, um, a lingering question, despite the fact that breach notification has been around for a while. We still run into all the time, well, how do I know if there's been a breach? Right. Yes. So, so we want to uh, talk about that. Let me let me back up a little bit to, to get closure on this number issue because there, there's there's some nuances um, at, as to who gets notified when. So let's try to clarify some of those first. First of all, HHS is always going to get notified whether it's 500 uh, or more or it's one. Okay. The difference is if it's greater than 500, then um, you have to notify HHS within 60 days. Okay, within 60 days of the breach, that's the time period you have to notify. If it's less than 500, if it's 1, 2, 10, or 499, you still have to notify HHS, but in that case, you do it at the end of the calendar year, not the end of your fiscal year. You know, at the end of the calendar year, you again have 60 days to notify HHS. So anytime there's a breach, HHS is going to get notified. Anytime there's a breach, the patient is going to get notified, whether it's 10,000 or 1. Okay, you have to notify that one patient or all 10,000. Obviously, the costs are going to differ, but the requirement is the same. Now, there is uh, a question as to when do you notify major media in a state. All right, and here's where the 500 and 501 get a little bit confusing, but easy enough to look up. Um, so if you have 501, I believe, greater than 500, not just 500, but greater than 500, in uh, patients whose PHI were compromised in a particular state or jurisdiction, then you have to notify major media in that jurisdiction. Okay, And if you had, for example, patients scattered throughout Florida, northern Florida, central Florida, southern Florida, you would have to notify major media in all of those um, major media outlets. Okay, Because you're trying to get to the patients. You may have bad contact information. Some people are elderly and don't use email, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? So if you cross that threshold in a, in a single state or jurisdiction, you have to notify major media. Okay? But let's say, for example, you had 250 patients compromised in the state of Georgia and 251 patients compromised in the state of Florida. There, you don't have greater than 500 in, uh, in aggregate in a single state or jurisdiction and no major media would have to be notified, but still HHS would have to be notified because it's greater than 500. Okay, So there are these nuances as to when um, major media is has to be notified, and depending on the distribution of patients, what major media has to be notified. Okay, So right. now uh, with that, let's jump to um, your, your question. John, which is when is breach notification triggered? So there's a three-part analytical framework that we derived uh, from the regulations that and, and the guidance provided by HHS, and it makes up the essence of our breach notification framework. Uh, this three-part, three sort of questions that you ask to figure out whether or not whether or not breach is, is notification is triggered. Okay. Question number one is, was the privacy rule compromised in conjunction with unsecured PHI? Okay. Now, you would think that that's a relatively straightforward question to answer, 
But if you if you think about it for a, longer than a few seconds or a few minutes, what does it mean for the privacy rule to be compromised? Okay. Well, our breach notification framework walks through the 164.502 general rule that references about eight or nine other sections within the privacy rule, and you have to go through these series of questions to figure out, was there a privacy rule violation? If there's no privacy rule violation, there can't be a breach by definition, okay? But mm -hmm. figuring out whether there's been a privacy rule violation is not as trivial as it may sound, okay? Unsecured PHI means PHI that hasn't been encrypted according to the HHS secretary's recommended protocols, which are really NIST protocols, in a manner that would render the PHI unreadable, unusable, and or indecipherable. Okay, essentially unencrypted PHI or PHI that was maybe encrypted but to a lower standard than what the HHS secretary recommended. Now, you might think that's a pretty straightforward question. You know, did you did the, did the, did the organization either apply encryption or not apply encryption. Well, again, it's not as straightforward as it seems because there's a different protocol. There's a protocol for encrypting data at rest, which means data on your uh, file servers, on your EHR server, or on right. That's just in, in any databases that you may have. That's data at rest, right? Is is did you use the right pro protocol for data at rest? If it was data at rest that was actually compromised, right? It might have been compromised through somebody sniffing the wire. And in which case, then, you have to ask the question, did you implement the protocol that was recommended by the secretary for um, essentially data in transit, okay? And then third, uh, the third possible way uh, that um, that breach, uh, you know, could be, uh, that the PHI could be um, impacted and therefore you wouldn't take advantage of the breach notification safe harbor with respect to encryption is not so much, it's not so much an encryption, but it's related to the safe harbor, is if you destroyed PHI in a manner that rendered it unusable, unreadable, or indecipherable. And there are guidelines provided by the secretary as to how you should go about destroying PHI. Now, there are all kinds of stories about people, you know, let's say, for example, uh, donating their old copiers to hospice or something, and without realizing that these copiers have images of all the PHI that's ever been copied on them, and, and you know, not cleaning old PCs correctly. And it's not just delete, but forensically clean, right? And so, so the, the question of whether it was unsecured PHI, again, is, is is a forensics question. It's not a trivial question to answer. So that that's a so part step number one is two part question. Was the privacy rule compromised uh, in this particular uh, breach attempt? Okay, and and was it of unsecured PHI? If the answer is yes, that the, the privacy rule you determined by going through the sections of 164.502 that the privacy rule was was compromised and that it was unsecured PHI, then you go on to step two, okay? And step two is actually, from an analytical perspective, more, um, it's, an easy, it's, an e it's, it's easier to grasp in the sense that what you ask in step two is, do any of the exceptions to the breach definition apply? Now, these are definitions that are included in HHS definition of breach. Okay, so these aren't like random exceptions. These are codified, okay? And what you do is you compare your fact pattern to each one of these exceptions, and it says, does this fact pattern fall into one of these exceptions? If it falls into one of these exceptions, then no breach is triggered by definition. So let me give you an example of um, how this process works, is comparing, comparing hypotheticals, something that lawyers are... Um, accustomed to just at a law school, you have to do a lot of that, and, and, in, and in practice, you're always kind of looking at hypothetical. Uh, so the first one says, okay, so and this this happens all the time, 365 days a year, every day, it happens that somebody faxes the wrong the the patient's uh, PHI to the wrong doctor or the wrong specialist. Okay, mm -hmm. so one of the exceptions says, hey, if both parties are 
are um, covered entities or required to comply with HIPAA, and you get reasonable assurances that the that the other party destroyed the facts or destroyed the paper or destroyed the communication, then there's no breach. Okay, because hey, this happens all the time. You know what I mean? We're not trying to we're not trying to micromanage this stuff. This is this is innocuous, fairly innocent. You sent it to the wrong covered entity. Okay, they they know that they're not supposed to share PHI. You call them up. You say sorry. Destroy that. Okay, that's one fact pattern. Another fact pattern is, you know, and, and actually there's, you know, there, there, there are nuanced differences. I don't know why HHS sort of decided to break them up this way, but they did. Okay, um, is uh, did you give it, did you give it to uh, the, uh, the PHI to a, the wrong person working under the same covered entity or with the same covered entity, okay? Which is, for example, uh, nurses are responsible and doctors are obviously responsible for certain patients, okay? And a particular nurse gave a chart to a doctor, but that doctor wasn't the doctor for this particular patient whose chart the nurse was handing off, okay? Again, that's two uh, members of the same workforce the nurse got got it back. There's no harm there, right? That happens all the time, right? So, you know, contrary to popular belief, Big Brother is really not trying to get in 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 the way of micromanaging actual innocent things that happen uh, on a daily basis within covered entities uh, and business associates. And and um, and the third one, I actually can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, what what it is? It's it's somewhat um, different than than the, the first two, but there's a third exception that that our breach anal uh, uh, analytical framework, uh, breach notification framework, deals with right. And third hypothetical, and you look at your your set of facts and say, okay, does it meet any one of these? If it does, we can claim an exception. Okay, if you can claim an exception, you're done. There's no breach by definition. Only then do you get to the third part of uh, the breach notification framework, which is, is there a low probability that the PHI, the PHI in question was actually compromised? And here's where the trouble starts, because, because the regulations presume a breach. They presume a breach at this point. So it's, it's the burden of the covered entity or the business associate to prove the low probability threshold. Okay. Okay. Now I don't um, I don't know if this is the third exception, but it's a um, hypothetical that I'm familiar with uh, from our, our past study of uh, HIPAA compliance. If you uh, give a uh, if you give PHI to say the wrong patient, you know, they're checking out. You you give them PHI, they walk out the doors, and you realize rather immediately. And you um, you catch them, you retrieve that PHI before they've had an opportunity to um, uh, to examine it, or really before there's been an opportunity for that information to really get out to that third person. They haven't had a chance to look at it. Now, uh, my understanding is that that wouldn't um, qualify either, though I don't I don't recall if that's the third exception. Yeah, that in fact is the third part. That, that that is the third. Um third exception and if you want more guidance um, into these hypotheticals uh, it's the 500 page uh, omnibus rule that contained um, this extended commentary about these hypotheticals and what is in or out etc right so if you want to go to the source then you're going to crawl through the, the relevant part of that 500 page omnibus rule um, both changes to the regulations and commentary, which is, is really a, a great reference. So the, the third um, fact pattern, the third exception is exactly that. Here's the, here's the scenario that HHS gave in the omnibus rule. So say, for example, you are, you are um, discharging a patient, okay? You're discharging a patient and you're wheeling them out and you believe that this person that's walking next to you is you know, the, 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 the guardian or, you know, somebody that legally could have the PHI, you give them that, per, that chart and you realize, like, almost instantly that that, that person was the wrong person, okay, that, that they're, they're not related, you know, they just happen to be walking by. And you, you, you take the chart back and you can determine, reasonably determine that there's no way that that 
information could have been compromised because that person just didn't have time to read it. They didn't have time to process the information or look at it. Okay. Now, if you sent if you sent the PHI home, or it, it was an extended period of time, then the presumption is, works against you. If there's an extended period of time that went by, if you didn't catch it in, uh, until you had to chase this person down through three floors and try to find them in a the cafeteria or some sort of nonsense like that, or you know, God forbid, they actually went home with it, then the presumption is that it was compromised and they did look at it, right? So that's the third sort of thing. You kind of handed it off to the wrong person, and that could happen a lot, right? Say people share hospital rooms, you can hand something to a parent, it's the wrong parent, etc. That's that's the third exception. So if your hypothetical, if your set of facts fall into one of those three, then there's no breach by by definition. Right. And um, so who really notifies? Uh, does the uh, does the entity itself have to actually Actually, carry out the notification process if you know if, if this unfortunate circumstance happens and you need to you need to notify perhaps hundreds or thousands of people and and uh, go through all this analysis, reach out to local media and the regions that were affected. That's that's a whole lot of work on top of trying to uh, run your healthcare organization or your business associate, what have you. So, um, do you? Uh, Individually have to have to do that, or can you outsource that to a certain extent? Um, well, first of all, it's the covered entity's responsibility to notify. Okay, and the reason that that's not just a the obvious answer is the question. It begs the question: Well, what happens if a breach happens in an information system um, that contains PHI that's controlled by a business associate? Okay. Ah, okay. Then what? Well, how does that change uh, the whole notification scheme? Well, first of all, it's just the, the the one takeaway should be it's it's always it's always 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 the covered entity's burden to notify. Okay, but now this this breach actually happened uh, on an information on an information system controlled by a business associate. That business associate has 60 days from the date of discovery, from the date of when the breach was known or should have been known to notify the covered entity. The covered entity then has 60 days to do the right thing depending on the number again. Okay, so now in our breach notification, con I mean in our business associate contracts, we have built in that the parties need to come up with a communication mechanism in case of this eventuality so that when your hair's on fire, you're not trying to figure out what is the format, the medium, the contact people that we're going to uh, invoke and use to communicate this information when we've had uh, a major breach. Now, it goes even deeper than that because now subcontractors of BAs who are using, uh, the let's say, the BA's PHI, which is really not the BA's PHI, but it's the covered entity's PHI, but we're further down the chain, let's call it the BA's PHI, to perform some business function on behalf of the BA. If a breach happens in their in the information system that they control, they have 60 days to notify the BA. The BA has 60 days to notify the covered entity, and so on. So there's this potential notification chain. But at the end of the day, it's always going to be the covered entity that has to notify. Um, which is why the covered entity. Probably, I'm sorry. Let me let me finish this point down. Which is why the covered entity has a stake in. Not actually, the covered entity, first of all, is not required to have business associate agreements with subcontractors. That's the VA's responsibility. But the, the covered entity does have a stake in saying to your direct VAs, please make sure that you have a communication mechanism set up with your subcontractors in case this happens. We want this information to flow, you know, uh, freely and in, in the right manner, et cetera, et cetera, right? Now, the one, the one exception to the timing of the notification is if the BA is actually an agent of the covered entity. Okay, now agency is controlled by federal law in this case because it's a HIPAA is a federal statute, and um, there's a Supreme Court case CCNV v. Reed. You Google that, and and it was actually a copyright case, but the Supreme Court went through these like 20 factors that determine agency. Okay, so it doesn't matter whether your business associate contract says you're an agent or not, because obviously all contracts, including ours, 
by definition saying that the parties aren't agents, okay? But that doesn't matter. What matters is how much control, generally you can think about it, is how much control does one organization have over another. And this is the best example that I can give you is sort of the hypothetical. Let's say your brother-in-law uh, is a CPA and you have a big enough practice where your brother-in-law just works for you. You're, you're the only client, okay? And you control when your brother-in-law um, comes to work, you control when they take vacation. You can make an argument, he has an office within your building. The federal government can make an argument that, you know what, even though you guys are separate legal entities and you pay each other and treat each other from a tax perspective, we, now we really think the brother-in-law is an agent because, because you know, because the, the practice has so much economic control over this particular individual that, you know, that we, we, we believe under these set of facts it meets the agency test. Now, don't, don't take this as every subcontractor and every sort of brother-in-law relationship would fall into that. It's just, just a hypothetical, okay? But the reason that it has any import at all is that if the business associate is considered to be an agent, then the, the clock starts ticking uh, for the covered entity when the BA knew or should have known. Okay? They don't get an extra 60-day period. The clock starts ticking as soon as the VA knows and the VA is an agent. That's when the clock starts ticking for the CE. So, uh, you know, again, things may appear to be relatively straightforward, but now you get this chain of VAs. You get this sort of agency question. 99 times out of 100, there's not going to be agency. Maybe, you know, greater than that, but there could be, right? And so it's another thing that you need to... Uh, consider now. I'm not sure, John. I, I went off on this rant whether I actually answered the question, but um, yeah, but, no, you you absolutely did, and uh, it's a great point about um, about the agency relationship. Uh, if that's found um, largely, um, whether largely depending on how much uh, control uh, there exists or how much control there apparently exists. I don't want to go off into too much of a um, legal tangent, but is um, is apparent agency um, uh, sufficient enough for uh, for that clock to start ticking as though the BA was a extension of the covered entity? Well, you know, I mean, it's it's hard to say what 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 how a court of law would determine apparent agency or whether they they would make that sort of nuanced. You know, uh, I I don't think this is this is you know I'm not pointing to any any precedent here. But I don't, I don't think parent agency is going to carry the day. I think you have to be an agent, which means, you know, a court of law would have to go through those 20 factors identified in CC and BB Reed and conclude, no, you're an agent. You know what I mean? Obviously, this is probably going to happen after the fact, right? So there's not going to be any, any judicial, this is looking backwards when you should have notified and probably, a, a, you know, impacts maybe the weight of your penalty because this VA was an agent because the court, why, why was the VA an agent? To answer your question, because the court of law said so. A federal court said they were an agent, that's it. That's the law, unless it's overturned on appeal. Okay, so I don't think a parent agency would, would, would carry the day. Interesting. So, uh, all right, so uh, legal tangents aside, uh, the chain, uh, the potential chain that we're talking about of, uh, you know, as you go further down, everyone has 60 days to notify the next person up in the chain. Now, just in practice, this may be limited by you know, reality, but could this chain theoretically just go on and on and on? So, essentially, the, uh, the patient whose PHI was uh, compromised, it, doesn't even need to hear until, say, a year later. Yeah, I mean, you could you could develop a hypothetical where that would be the case, right? Uh, we have subcontractors of subcontractors of subcontractors. As a practical matter, though, you know, um, we all know that 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 um, that the depth of that chain, to use a, a sort of a computer science. Um, term, right, like you talk about the depth of a, a binary tree or whatever, the depth of that chain is practically going to be limited to probably three or four, right, and I mean like on outside cases maybe you could see like four or five, but that, that's the limit, right, that, that, as a practical matter. As a theoretical matter, you're absolutely right, yeah, it could go on for a hundred, for example, right, in which case the, in which case the 60 days and 60 days and 60 days of pay would take a long time.
time for the patient to uh, to be notified. Right. And how much does this cost? I mean, we see notification, uh, we see breach notifications go out all the time. The wall of shame always grows. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a few hundred records, sometimes it's several thousand records. How does that really break down? Financially? Yeah, so there's, yeah, so there's this, you know, there's the Pony Mon Institute who is sort of like the gold standard um, estimator. They've been doing these studies now for five, six, seven years, maybe longer, okay? And they do it across industries, and obviously healthcare is, is becoming more prominent because the bad guys have figured out that healthcare is soft, and so you're seeing more more breaches in healthcare. And um, the Ponymon Institute actually determines, um, has determined that it costs $300, $300 per record to notify. Now, uh, to be honest, a little unclear to me exactly all the factors that go into that $300, but I publicly have sort of kind of challenged those numbers because let's let's take a simpler let's take a simple number like 200 if it were 200 and and you know for some for some industries it is cheaper than 300 300 is on on the higher side and healthcare for some reason is is higher okay um, I'm, not, I'm not I'm not sure why maybe the complexity of the PHI you know whatever right uh, or or the complexity of the analysis that has to go on but if you had a breach of 5,000 records which is you know I mean I'm, how many records could you hold on a thumb drive now? Hundreds of thousands, maybe millions, right? I mean, mm -hmm. some, under Moore's law, thumb drives just hold more and more. But to say it was a small breach of 5,000, well, if it was $200 per record, that's a million dollars. And you're talking about a small clinic uh, or a small uh, practice. I mean, you know, they could easily have 100,000 uh, records or more. I mean, you're talking about notification costs that are going out of business numbers, okay? And the problem I have with what Ponymon, um, the Ponymon Institute has done is I don't see that in reality. I don't see that as a practical matter, people actually incurring those costs. Now, nobody really shares, right? Nobody's publicly sharing what these costs are. So this sort of this cognitive dissonance between this theoretical number that the Ponymon Institute says it is and what anecdotally you sort of view and you, and you say what the market is actually telling us it is. But that notwithstanding, it's a big enough number it's going to ruin your day. It's going to cost you a lot of money. You know right. I mean? And that's just the cost of notification. notification. Right. How much? And, and I, I, I don't believe, and I, I, don't, I don't really believe that, you know, the, 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 the fines from HHS are factored into that for one, for one reason. I'm, I'm not sure what basis the Ponemon Institute could use to calculate a fine because you know, there's a, there's a, um, sure, there's a $1.5 million max per every um, violation of a similar kind, and you do get some relief there, okay, in that whether it's 5,000 records on the breach or 50,000 records uh, from HHS, the fine is going to be $1.5 million because they're going to treat that as a similar type of violation, okay? So mm -hmm. you, 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 get, you get some relief there, but uh, what you don't get is, is that's just a fine. Right, that's not a notification cost. That's just a fine. And as we talked about earlier, so HHS is going to come in and do an audit. What else are they going to find? Right, that's that's just a certain type of violation. You can get you can get fined. Right, if it's willful neglect, fifty thousand dollars per violation. Right. So and we've already seen recently. Right, this is circa um, August 2016 that we're doing this recording. Recently, we've seen within the last few weeks a fine of. I think it was over $5 million, the largest fine that HHS has ever um, issued against a covered entity. So um, so the numbers are, the exact numbers are really hard to quantify, but they're big. They're big, and mm -hmm. they're going to ruin your reputation likely and not ruin it, but damage it and, and, and perhaps ruin it and, and cost you a lot of money. That's certain. Right, right. So that's uh, a huge player in why breach notification is the 800 pound gorilla. Uh, exactly. it's, it's, it's really a, um, a manifestation of that this is no longer a paper tiger that it used to be. Exactly, exactly. Martin, uh, do you have any questions? Not at this time. All right. Uh, John, is, I mean, are you, are you um, sort of at the end of your thinking, your questions here on, on uh, breach notification? 
Yeah, at this at this time, uh, I think we've uh, covered it fairly well. I, mean, I think I we do have covered, a comment. I think we, but, uh, but go ahead, Mark. Go ahead. Yeah. The reason why the um, breach notification is more expensive is it has more value on the criminal market. So more protections have to be put in place after uh, to make sure everybody gets covered. I, that's my assessment. I just well that yes. I mean it's it's. I, I think I'm gonna I'm gonna just kind of translate to Martin um, for the audience is is the um, purportedly and again these are numbers that you know what I mean are anecdotal. But purportedly, for example, a a a record of containing PHI. Because of its richness, it has the patient name probably, may, may have the patient address, it may have these medical conditions, it, who knows, maybe it has credit card information. It has a lot more information that is rich in the sense that uh, it, it's valued more in the black market for the purposes of identity theft. Okay, But that really doesn't, uh, Martin, factor into, that's separate, right, from a factor that would factor into notification costs. Okay, I, I mean, the, the, you, you have to notify. I mean, you have to notify whether even if the, the the identity theft was worthless, the record was worthless on the black market, right? So whether it's zero, fifty, a hundred, or a thousand, it's not going to impact your your notification costs. It just uh, it does speak to the fact that healthcare is likely to remain a major target for uh, for uh, for the bad guys. Right, it speaks to that, but I don't think it speaks directly to notification costs. Okay. All right, uh, Carlos, do you have any uh, closing words for us? Yeah, let me let me let me wrap this up in, uh, with, with, with this. Um, is there there are um, if you, if you've been following the conversation at all about the sort of audit, HHS audit protocol and requirements and our other discussions. Um, in this series, where we talk about um, you know having uh, visible demonstrable evidence per requirement, etc., um, there are ten requirements of the audit protocol. All the 169 ten are devoted to the breach notification rule, and the reason I want to mention them here is that they are a horse of a different color. The the requirements for the breach notification rule have to do with: Do you have model letters in place? Do you have some sort of incident? document where you would capture the analysis? Do you have a methodology in place that would allow you to walk through and determine whether or not breach is triggered or not? Okay, do you have these things in place? Okay, it's a preparedness. It's a preparedness set of requirements. So our breach notification framework deals with exactly that. Gives you the methodology to uh, walk through whether or not it's triggered. Now when it says it gives it to you, it's not something we invented. Right, it's something that we distilled from the regulations themselves, and that's where we came up with this three-part analytical framework, and then elaborated on that. But we provide model letters, we provide these other things that help you comply with those uh, preparedness requirements, and that's part of our coverage of the 169 uh, re, uh, audit protocol requirements. The other, the other part comes in, you know, our privacy rule checklist, or security rule checklist, and some of our other our training, etc. But the breach notification framework does cover those ten preparedness uh, audit protocol requirements that HHS has published. So um, I, I think we, with that we can call this a wrap. And uh, thank you, uh, everybody, for listening. And uh, hope you come back next time for our next uh, in-line series of the Director's Cut. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Have a good day.